The last module of this lecture um, is about a generalization of the whole analysis pipeline. And it introduces the idea of the prediction function. Uh, this is where it actually starts to get interesting with brain-computer interfaces. So I'll uh, show you the idea of that. You can theoretically say this is an alternative to the entire signal processing framework. But um, we'll see that you can use it to in, in some form of combination. You could say that a brain-computer interface, which has a limited memory of the past, so it doesn't um, doesn't depend on things that happened, say, 10 minutes ago or so, um, can be viewed as a mathematical function or mapping of some input chunk of signal, which is basically a matrix, uh, number of channels times number of time points in the memory, uh, onto the output uh, of the BCI. Um, and so the output is, uh, can be a single number, like uh, it can actually be binary, like excited or not excited, or continuous value or anything like that can be multidimensional. And so the history length basically is the size of this matrix. And you can say uh, to apply this, you sort of slide it over the EEG and, and always um, query it at a particular time when you're interested in the output. So the form of this function is basically arbitrary. Uh, it's, it's just a function of form like this example here. Uh, it's up to you. And what's interesting is it, uh, it depends not just on x, but usually it tends to depend on some extra parameters, like this w here or the b here. And these parameters turn out to be usually not known very precisely in advance or ad hoc. Um, and we'll, we'll say a few things about that. Uh, so um, what you can, however, say about the function of form, aside from the fact that it's up to you, is it should reflect in some sense, the, the relationship between um, the observation that you made, the EEG chunk, and um, the, the desired um, thing that you are trying to infer, um, the, the cognitive state parameter, such as the person is excited or not. So there is a relationship between the person being excited and the EEG, of course. And this relationship is mathematical and has to show up somewhere in the function of form. You can be very principled and say there is a so-called forward model, um, such as you say, well, there is some mechanism in, in neurons that, that relates to what I care about, such as a person is, say, more excited, there's, say, more activity in certain neurons or so, and say they fire at higher rate. I'm making this up. <laughs> uh, and so if you have enough neurons in a large enough patch of cortex, it what generates a, um, a, a field, an electromagnetic field, that is strong enough to uh, rise above the noise floor at, at your sensors. And so that, and there's electromagnetic relationships here, and that gives rise to the sensor signals ob that you observe plus whatever noise the sensor picks up. So that would be an example for module, uh, model. And you can obviously start with lots of literature on where you think this happens, how it expresses itself, what kinds of neural circuits are affected, how it should map onto the sensors, what kinds of noise processes occur, like cable sway and sweating artifacts, and so on and so on. But the trouble is that the functional form needs to actually map from here back to the latent cause of what happened here. And so it's basically the inverse of the forward mapping. But that's a way to approach the whole problem in a principled way. Uh, and we can work our way backwards and sort of rephrase this also in, in terms of signal processing if we wanted to. So it's the, the inverse of some forward process, if you will. And that should guide uh, the design of this function of form. And there's a few components in that function of form that we already kind of discussed. Uh, one is a big chunk of this thing is the relationship between what happens in cortex versus what, what you see at the sensors, and we know it's linear volume conduction. So if you say um, the observation, a chunk of EEG that you, that you stick into your function is some matrix times uh, the equivalent number of source samples or source observations time points, so to speak. That would be the forward mapping. So source times matrix equals sensor signal. And there is a corresponding inverse if that mapping is invertible. Um, we we'll say W is the inverse of A here, uh, which would re give you the source signals from the sensor signals. Um, just again, applied to this matrix that you stick into your function. 
And uh, again, you know, this is spatial filters in one case and forward mappings in the other. So this little building block is integral <laughs> to the design of, of this functional form because it inverts the volume conduction effect. But it wouldn't be the only one. It only takes care of one step in this generative process. You still have to deal with, um, say, how the source time courses, say a ripple uh, in a bunch of neurons and their electromagnetic fields, relates to the cognitive process that you are trying to kind of estimate or approximate or parameter that you're trying to infer. And so this gives rise to other parts of this mapping that are sort of applied after you did that uh, because you want to operate on source um, processes. And so here are a few examples. So this would be an entirely linear thing. You have this thing um, which gives you source matrix, uh, you know, source signal matrix. You vectorize it into a vector. You multiply it by some other vector, inner product, and add a number. <laughs> I say something about that. This is, in fact, an ERP um, uh, regressor. You can have nonlinear things in there, such as, say, you take the absolute value uh, or magnitude of something and so on and so on. You can you know, have a temporal filter in there. We'll break this down and discuss a few parts, but these are already sort of fully functional BCIs, in fact, um, that are written in this one liner equation. So um, that makes it a bit clear that it can be very convenient to write BCIs in that form uh, and also to implement them in that way. So this would be um, the equation for our, for our neurofeedback BCI from the previous module. You have the chunk of signal X matrix. You apply a linear transform to that. This is the T matrix. It's, it's a number of samples by number of samples matrix. And it implements the linear filter, actually. Um, it turns out the matrix in, I'm not sure, rows or columns, uh, in each, say, column, it has the um, filter kernel. And it's shifted uh, for the different samples, because the filter kernel obviously needs to be applied uh, for different outputs with different shifts. So um, that would be a, a very simple uh, way to write the same thing. And uh, there's, however, one thing. And that is the, the main issue with that is that if you apply this function to a chunk of EG, and then 10 milliseconds later, you apply it to a 10 millisecond shifted chunk of EG, you're doing a lot of redundant computation. You're, say, doing the same spectral transform for almost the same data, and so on. And so if you had used signal processing, say, to implement that, you would have used much more efficient, uh, usually, filters that have been tuned over the last 20 years, such as a recursive IIR or FIR filter. Um, so recursive means they reuse, in a sense, some of the previous outputs. So you have this benefit of the conceptual simplicity in a sense, but you have the drawback that in many cases you are doing more computation than you would have done if you had used um, signal processing parts for some of the expensive things. But it turns out you can use the two easily in combination. You can say there is some expensive calculation that I have to do on the signal, such as spectra filtering. And, um, you can use that to get a spectrally filtered signal, and then you apply this prediction function to chunks of that, uh, and just do um, sort of the last step there. That would look somewhat like this. Uh, say you have a bunch of signals. You send them through a filter chain or filter graph. All of these are signal processing modules following the same rules that we discussed earlier in the lecture, such as linear, time invariant, and so on. And that gives you a processed output You've done all the efficient calculations and recursive formulations and so on already here. And then you are only doing one last step on a sort of sliding window here and apply this function. And here you have all the flexibility of the prediction function, basically. So uh, I should say you can obviously also have sort of multiple filter chains, multiple outputs, and your function sort of takes two matrices. These can even have different lengths if you want to. So this can be very long history view into your EMG, and this can be short, uh, fast changing uh, you know, view into the EEG. And so spelling out the same neurofeedback PCI in that framework says, 
We'll do the bandpass filter, the FIR filter, just using a signal processing block. Efficiently gives us a bandpass filtered signal. And the prediction function is the log variance of that. Um, that, uh, you know, chunk of filtered signal. So this is a, a relatively neat way of framing this. And so it makes, makes it clear that different frameworks have different strengths. And uh, this is also how uh, you will see um, you can write BCIs in, in, in a BCI lab toolbox. You can design these things separately um, or in combination. And um, so when you view this kind of design from the outside, it acts in a sense like an oracle. You pipe some signal in, and at some time point, you, you invoke the prediction function. You say, OK, what? is the cognitive state at this time point. Uh, you know, I'm always saying cognitive state in, in quotes um, because it's easy to confuse the estimate of the thing that the BCI produces with the real thing that happens in the brain, of course. So um, uh, you, you can say it's sort of an oracle, OK? Uh, also, a <laughs> um, little side note, usually what modern BCI's output is not a, a single number or so, like minus one or plus one, but rather say the probability that a um, person is in this state and the probability that the person is in that state or so. But that's just, um, that's just sort of a little side note. Uh, and that takes us to the end of this uh, little whirlwind tour through signal processing and brain-computer interfaces.